But right now, I'm really uh, excited uh, to introduce uh, Jason Collins. Now, Jason co-founded uh, the behavioral economics team in, in PwC, and Jason will continue to warm us uh, into NudgeDoc, uh, but with a word of, a, a word of caution. Um, that in our hunger to codify, simplify, better understand um, some of the elements of psychology and attracted to some of the studies that we might hear, that we run the risk of, of missing some sort of critical underlying uh, assumptions. Um, so Jason's uh, going to uh, help to lead us in a discussion. The title is, Aren't We Smart Fellow Behavioral Scientists? Welcome to Nudge Talk 2020, Jason Collins. Thank you very much, Sam. And oh, we are a clever bunch, I have to say. <laughs> um, so, to open up, just note that like it's been a pretty good ride over the last um, decade or two for behavioral scientists. We've had best-selling books, Nobel Memorial Prizes, um, every second government department and corporate has set up a team, but recently the winds seem to have changed. We're told that behavioral economics is itself biased. We're told, don't trust the psychologists on coronavirus. Many of the responses to COVID-19 come from a deeply flawed discipline. And beyond that, nudge boy has become a pejorative. I believe this challenge is deserved. For too long, we've been opining about people's irrationality, and that's the irrationality of others. And if only we designed the world more intelligently, people would make better decisions. But we often make these judgments based on narrow lab experiments that we generalize to the outside world. But as we well know, sometimes those experiments don't replicate, even in that narrow lab environment. And of those that do, many become an ineffective or even dangerous tool when we try and apply them to the complex outside world. So let me tell you a story to, to illustrate this. And this story comes from great work by Joshua Miller and Adam Sanherho, and it stands for me as one of the starkest examples where I've been forced to change my beliefs. Now the story starts in the lab where there's a lot of pretty strong evidence that people have misperceptions about what randomness looks like. So when a person is asked to generate a series that approximates the flipping of a coin, they'll alternate between heads and tails too often and balance the frequencies of heads and tails over too short a sequence. When people are asked to judge which of two different sequences of coin flips are more likely, such as these two here, they tend to pick the sequences with more alternation, despite the probability of each sequence being the same. But what happens when we go out of the lab and look for randomness in the outside world? And the place we will talk a bit, bit about this is in the world of basketball, where people often see a hot hand. So they'll describe players as hot and in form. And they believe that the person who's just hit a shot or a series of shots is more likely to hit their next one. So the question becomes, is this belief in the hot hand a rational belief? Or is the hot hand an illusion, whereby just like they do with coins, they're seeing streaks in what is actually randomness. Now, there was a very famous examination of this question by Thomas Gilovich, Robert Vallon, and Amos Tversky. And they took shot data from a variety of sources, including the Philadelphia 76ers, Boston Celtics, and they, and they looked at it for evidence of a hot hand. And what did they find? Well, they found simply that the hot hand was, a, was an illusion. So as Daniel Kahneman wrote in Thinking Fast and Slow when describing this research, he wrote, the hot hand is entirely in the eye of the beholders who are consistently too quick to perceive order and causality and randomness. The hot hand is a massive and widespread cognitive illusion. Now, possibly even more interesting was the reaction to the findings from those in the sporting world. So despite the analysis, many sports figures denied that it could be true. So Red Auerbach, who coached the Boston Celtics to nine NBA championships, he said, who is this guy? So he makes a study, I couldn't care less. And this provides another insight about which Gilovich wrote. The story of our research on the hot hand is only partly about the misperception of random events. It is also about how tenaciously people cling to their beliefs, even in the face of hostile evidence. So this isn't just about the perception of the hot hand, but also about the failure of people to see their error when people, when they were presented with evidence about it. So let's just delve into a bit how Gilovich, Fallon and Tversky showed this absence of a hot hand. So imagine a person who took 10 shots in a basketball game. So a ball is a hit and X is a miss. Now what would count as evidence of a hot hand? What we can do is look at shots following a previous hit. For instance, in this sequence of shots, there are six occasions where we have a shot followed by a previous hit. Five of those shots, such as the seventh, seventh here, are followed by another hit. We can then compare 
their normal shooting percentage with the proportion of shots they hit if the shot immediately before was a hit. So if the hit rate after a hit is higher than the normal shot probability, then we might say they get a hot hand. And that's effectively how Gilovich, Volon, and Diversky examined the hot hand in coming to their conclusion that the hot hand doesn't exist. And they also looked after whether there was um, hits or misses after longer streaks of hit or misses, but this captures the basic me methodology. And it seems pretty sensible. But now I'm gonna take on a bit of a detour again, um, and then come back to, uh, back to this basketball story. But this detour involves flipping a coin. Now, suppose you flip a coin three times. So here are the eight possible sequence of heads, of heads and tails. And each sequence has an equal probability of occurring. So what if I asked you, if you were to flip a coin three times, and there, in that streak, there is a heads followed by another, another heads, what is it, sorry, if there is a heads followed by another flip, what is the expected probability that another heads will follow that heads? So let's just, let's look at this a little bit closer. So for each of those sequences, here's the proportion of heads following a previous flip of heads for each sequence. And just to give you like illustrate how that's worked out in the first row, we have the first flips ahead, it's followed by a head. The second flip is ahead and it's also followed by a head. So 100% of the heads are followed by a heads if, it's, if there's a flip after it. In the second row, 50% of the heads are followed by a head. And if we go to the last two rows, there's actually no heads, which are then followed by another flip. So there's no proportion there. Now, so I've asked you that question again. If you were to flip a coin three times and there is a heads followed by another flip in that sequence, what is the expected probability that another heads will follow that heads? Now, it turns out the answer to that is 42%, which I get by averaging those proportions. And that just doesn't seem right. So it seems a bit odd. But if we count across the sequences, we can actually see that there are 12 flips of heads followed by another flip. Six of the following flips of heads, six of tails, just on 50% as you expect. So what's going on in that calculation I've done in the second column? And the answer is by looking at these short sequences, we're introducing a bias. The cases of heads tend to cluster together, um, such as in the first sequence with two cases of a heads followed by a heads. And it gets you know, a, a, a weighting within that final average. Yet the sequence tail heads tails, which only has one shot occurring after heads, it's equally likely, likely to occur. So the reason that a tails appears more likely to follow a heads and we get that 42% is because of this bias where the streaks cluster together. The expected value I get is 42% when in fact the actual probability of a heads following a heads as we know from common sense is 50%. Um, as a sequence of flips gets longer, that bias is smaller. But if we look at longer streaks, such as what, what's the probability after three heads, it, it goes um, down again. So it's a pretty counterintuitive story, pretty hard to get your head around. But now let's bring it back to why it matters, um, why I've bothered with this counterintuitive story about coin flipping. And the answer is because this bias is present in the methodology of the papers that purportedly demonstrated that there's no hot hand in basketball. Because of this bias, proportion of hits following a, sequence, a hit or sequence of hits is biased downwards. And so like our calculation using the coins, the expected pro proportion of hits following hit in the sequence is actually lower than the actual probability of hitting a shot. Conversely, the hot hand actually pushes the probability of hitting a shot up. And together, this downward bias and the hot hand cancelled each other out. And it led to this conclusion by the researchers that each shot is independent of the last. But the result is that when you correct for the bias, you can see that there actually is a hot hand in basketball. So when Miller and Sanherho crunched the numbers for one of the studies in the Gilovich and Friends paper, they found that the probability of hitting a shot following a sequence of three previous hits is 13 percentage points higher than after a sequence of three misses. So there truly is a hot hand. And you can just imagine if Red Auerbach had coached as though there was no hot hand, like what would his record have looked like then? So I should say that this point does not debunk the earlier point about people misperceiving randomness because the lab evidence, evidence on that is still strong. People see the hot hand when people flip coins. It's possible they even overestimate the strength of the hot hand in the wild, such, such as in a basketball game, but this is hard to show. But the hot hand surely exists. So let's turn back to one of the quotes that I showed earlier. The story of our research on the hot hand is only partly about the misperception of random events. It is also about how tenaciously people cling to their beliefs, even in the face of hostile evidence. The researchers expanded the original hot hand research from a story about people misperceiving randomness to one of them continuing to do so even when they were presented with evidence that they were making an error. But you know, we can see now that their belief in the hot hand wasn't an error. The punters in the stands were right. 
their accumulated experience had given them the answer and the researchers were wrong. So rather than the researchers asking whether they themselves were making an error when people refused to believe their research, they doubled down and identified a second failure of human reasoning. So the blunt dismissal of people's beliefs led behavioral scientists to hold an untrue belief themselves for over 30 years. And I'm, I'm among those people, not, not holding it for 30 years necessarily. But this is a persistent characteristic of much applied behavioral science. It was an error I made many times when I first came to the discipline in that we, we spend too little time questioning whether our understanding of the decisions or observations of other people um, are actually, you know, what their basis is. If we believe they are an error, we should first question whether the error is ours. And let me give you another short example. Um, there's a body of behavioral science research known as priming that suggests that even slight cues in the environment can change our actions. Now, a lot of priming research has bitten the dust through the replication crisis. Ideas such as words associated with old people slowing our walking pace, which is known as the Florida effect, or the images of money, money make us selfish, or that you can prime us with the Ten Commandments to make us honest. All these studies have fallen to the, to the wayside and haven't stood the test of time. Yet here's a passage from Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. When I, when I describe priming studies to audiences, the reaction is often disbelief. The idea you should focus on, however, is that disbelief is not an option. The results are not made up, nor are they statistical flukes. You have no choice but to accept that the major, con major conclusions of these studies are true. But, but no, again, it turns out that the doubt of these audiences in this case was justified. There's actually an interesting intersection between the priming research and the hot hand too. When you consider that much of this behavioral science research, including priming, it's built on the concept that subtle, often ignored features of our, of our environment can have marked effects on our decisions and performance. So why didn't the hot hand researchers consider that a basketball player would be influenced by their earlier shots? Surely a highly salient part of the environment and influence in their mental state. But alas, the desire to show one bias was allowed us to, allowed us to overlook another um, mental effect. So now I'm gonna to go to a more recent story. And this is about a concept called probability neglect. And the idea behind probability neglect is that when we consider a small risk, we tend to either ignore the risk or give it too much weight. We give disproportionate weight to the difference between zero and 1% relative to that difference between one and 99% probability. Now there's again, good evidence from the lab that we suffer from probability neglect in the same way that there's solid evidence about misperceptions of randomness. But once again, the danger emerges when we take this finding and use it to assess the decisions of people in the outside world. So here's a recent example by Nudge author and Nudge talk speaker, Cass Sunstein, that hasn't aged particularly well. Dr. Need of Bias that makes us panic about coronavirus with the subtitle, Feeling Anxious, Blame Probability to Neglect. And the opening paragraph of this article reads, at no stage can, can, can at no, oh, sorry, at this stage, no one can specify the magnitude of the threat from the coronavirus. But one thing is clear. A lot of people are more scared than they have any reason to be. They have an exaggerated sense of their own personal risk. If you can't specify a magnitude, it's somewhat hard to claim that a response is exaggerated. But beyond that, here we see a set of findings from the lab. Sunstein later in the article describes one of the lab experiments extrapolated to the real world with little time spent asking whether an experiment in the lab can capture the more complex dynamics around people's response to the coronavirus. In the lab, we know the probabilities, we, we, we've set them. But outside with coronavirus, we don't have any benchmark against which to assess people's responses. And as Sunstein notes, we don't even know the magnitude. Sunstein could have asked, some people are reacting more than I think they should. Is there something about their response that I should pay attention to? Why am I right and they wrong? And in fact, even when they are likely wrong, which is a real probability, perhaps those panicking are like the broken clock that is right twice a day. We should ask whether there is wisdom in their actions. What if there is an asymmetry in the potential costs and benefits of overacting versus underacting? Um, is it better, be, better to be typically wrong on probability, always assume there's a tiger in the grass, than to be largely right but occasionally experience ruin? Like, I'm not sure if the costs of me failing to have a haircut for four months are like, a, a lot um, particularly high relative to some of the other alternatives. Now, Sunstein, of course, wasn't exactly Robinson Crusoe in claiming we were overacting and overreacting in late February. And in fact, now it's not even entirely clear what the right response was for many people, regions and countries. But by late March, without skipping a beat, the headline was, this time the numbers show we can't be too careful. No mention of the allegation of misperception of risk four weeks earlier. 
And of course, one of the weaknesses of applied behavioral science is, that, and this, this breaks my heart in some ways, is that you can tell a story no matter what the observed behavior. And six weeks later, we have a headline, how to make coronavirus restrictions easier to swallow, giving guidance on how to stop an underreaction. So as Sunstein wrote there, to address the coronavirus pandemic, it is essential to influence human behavior, to promote social distancing, to get people to wear masks, to encourage people to stay home. Many nations have imposed mandates as well, but to enforce the mandates and to promote safer choices as the mandates wind down, people have to be nudged. So now it's all about trying to get people to stay home because they're underestimating the risk. So I guess the question is, is it, is it right, better to be right twice a day um, uh, than to be the clock that's always two hours slow? So these two stories about the hot hand and the coronavirus, I think they illustrate the danger of taking lab, lab experiments into a far more complex environment, the outside world. And you can already see some of the reasons why this can cause problems. We may not have the full set of information held by the decision maker. We might simply stuff up our analysis of the problem. It's com complex. But in closing, I want to suggest another problem with judging people's decisions. And that is that we can mistake or insufficiently consider what a person's objective actually is and how they can best achieve it. So behavioral scientists, I should say, have a better insight into this than many. We know that people aren't just selfishly trying to maximize their income, wealth or consumption. Yet despite this, when we assess people's behavior in the wild, we often assess the rationality of the behaviors against a rather narrow set of outcomes such as how do decisions benefit their finances or health in the long term. And then we try and nudge them in that, in that direction. But that's often not what people, what people want. So my PhD combined evolutionary biology with economics. So I often think about these objectives with an evolutionary lens. Our mind was selected to have preferences that would tend to result in survival and reproduction in the environment in which it evolved. And of course, most of, it don't, most of us don't specifically plot to maximize a reproductive output. Rather, evolution shapes our preferences so that we seek proximate objectives. And when we examine objectives from an evolutionary biology perspective, what appears irrational can simply be a misunderstanding on our part of what someone's objectives are. The type of behavior to say attract a partner is going to look somewhat different to that of someone simply maximizing financial resources. And in fact, someone might actually burn financial resources as part of their rational course of action. One reason for this is that a core part of the evolved toolkit is our use of signals. We want to signal our traits and resources to others, including allies, enemies, potential reproductive partners. Yet a problem with signals is that our interests are often not aligned with the recipient of our signal. We have an incentive to be dishonest and the recipient knows this. So as a result, we need a way to show our signal to be reliable. And one way we do this is through a signal that imposes a cost on us and not just any cost, an actual handicap that someone without the trait or resource could not fake. Now the now almost cliched example is the peacock's tail, which is a reliable signal of male health as only a male in good condition can maintain the unwieldy tail without falling prey to predators. In the same way, one of the best ways to signal wealth is to burn money. Health can be signaled by unhealthy behaviors that would fry someone with a lesser constitution. And as applied behavioral scientist, well, an implied behavioral scientist assessing these behaviors from the perspective of the long-term health or retirement savings is going to be somewhat confused. Yet when you see the objective, the behavior has a purpose. Of course, it does not immediately follow that understanding a person's evolutionary objectives will rationalize their behavior. As our taste for sweet and fatty foods implies, our preferences evolved in a world much different to ours. But it does suggest that we need to be wary in judging people's actions as their objective may not be what we think it is. And now I'll close with a plea. As applied behavioral scientists, we need to inject some humility into other people's decisions. We need to stop underestimating the intelligence of other people. We need to tone down the glee we have in communicating sexy, counterintuitive experimental findings that demonstrate errors by others. We need to stop making glib assumptions about what, what other people want and how they can best achieve their objectives. And importantly, we need to stop being lazy storytellers we don't subject ourselves to the same critique that we, we would apply to someone else. That's it, Sam. Thank you. Jason, thanks so much. How about that to, to wake up with your wheat bix? Hopefully not too many in the UK who are choking on their wheat bix this morning. Jason, really appreciate your time. And we have time just for, um, for, for, for maybe one question. Um, is there a classic um, behavioral economics study um, that has been overturned that, that hurts you the most? 
So I don't know if I call it a classic, but it's one that's close to my heart. It's, it's around a lot of the evolutionary um, psychology studies. So many of them are built in, uh, you know, built in an idea that certain um, cues in our environment will drive behavior. So a threat will cause safety seeking behavior, a, a something around, you know, an attractive partner will lead us to do conspicuous consumption. And yet a lot of those studies were actually done with priming. So they get someone to read a story about a romantic getaway and ask them about their spending intentions or get them to watch a scary movie. And those very same studies, which I've used in talks many times before, and that's why I'm not kind of why I find it so distressing, they're falling over for exactly the same reason that a lot of the other studies are. They're, they're built on a, I, I suppose, a, you know, a fairly narrow, narrow basis, then done you know, once with a small sample and, and never heard of again. And unfortunately, as we work back through those studies, they're, they're disappearing as well. I think underneath it, a lot of the a lot of the theory is good, but those studies don't do a particularly good job of uh, of showing that that theory has value. Jason, thank you so much uh, for your time today on, on Nudge Talk 2020. I think the team are busily working behind the scenes to remove all of our donation primes from the upcoming footage. Uh, and certainly there's a, there's a word to be had with Cass Sunstein this afternoon. Uh, so looking forward to, to that as well. Jason, uh, thank you so much. Looking forward to connecting. Uh, there are some great questions coming through at Slido that we might not have a chance to answer just now, but we'll look to spark that in social uh, to keep the conversation going. Jason, awesome. thank you.